second module, Cultivating a Culture of Justice in Nursing Education and Healthcare. We have been integrating the concept of justice in our courses and work with nurses for a number of years and have found it provides an important path through which to explore teamwork and collaboration. Our presentation is set in the backdrop of major changes in healthcare in the American social landscape. As the largest part of the healthcare workforce, nurses have the opportunity to respond to these changes in a way that seeks to ensure every person has the opportunity to receive the best possible treatment and care. Cultivating a culture of justice where nurses and patients are full partners requires knowledge and skills in teamwork and collaboration. However, before nurses can fully participate and respond effectively to rapidly changing healthcare settings, they must first uncover and address the long history of hierarchical and patriarchal structures that prevent full participation. It will require a conscious effort to change this powerful dynamic. How do students develop this ability? How would we as teachers know if our students are treated justly and in turn treat their patient fairly with unconditional regard? Do patients in their care feel safe? Are they applying the concepts from Module 6 on listening and connecting? In this module, we will explore the concept of justice and why it is necessary for creating educational and healthcare systems where nurses can fully lead and build teamwork and collaboration that ensures high quality care for all patients. We may assume that our students are collaborating because they complete group assignments in the classroom, talk with their nurse preceptors in clinical settings, and routinely provide us with subjective data. Yet looking at the knowledge, skills, and attitude statements on the CUSIN website related to teamwork and collaboration, it becomes evident that the competency contributing to resolution of conflict and disagreement, respecting the unique contributions that members bring to the team, including variations in professional orientations and accountabilities, requires more than knowledge about this competency or even the ability to apply this knowledge in a clinical situation. Rather, fostering open communication and collaboration is a complex practice that requires awareness, respect for differing views, integrity, assertive communication, and practice. For instance, how well can students navigate healthcare situations where there are disagreements, or respect and encourage the patient and family to express their needs and concerns? Understanding justice and how it supports equity in healthcare can be helpful in fostering these abilities. Now looking at the knowledge, skills, and attitude statements on the CUSIN website related to patient-centered care, it becomes apparent that the competency recognizing the patient and family as a source of control and full partner and attitudes like respecting patients' preferences, values, and needs requires more than knowledge about this competency or even the ability to apply this knowledge in a clinical situation. Rather, providing patient-centered care is a complex practice that requires attending, listening, and being present to the patient and family. For instance, how well can students see healthcare situations through the patient's eyes, or respect and encourage individual expression of patient values, preferences, and expressed needs? Narrative and reflective pedagogies can be helpful in fostering these abilities. So when we talk about creating a just workplace and a just culture, we really have to talk about what social justice is. What, what is the definition of social justice? And social justice refers to this concept um, that although we would like to believe that all people are created equally and they um, should be treated fairly and equally, that just simply does not happen in, in most societies. And, in most societies, there is a distribution of advantages and disadvantages that is not necessarily based on the idea that all people are created equally. Um, in fact, people based on um, their sex, their gender, their um, ethnic background, their socioeconomic um, group, receive advantages and disadvantages um, that um, we have to be aware of in order to create um, a more egalitarian society. And that's, this is really what um, social justice activists really work drive to do, is to provide access, access to, for individuals and for groups to the same um, goods and services um, that 
anybody is entitled to, um, regardless of their background, um, regardless of where they're from, regardless of um, who they are. And, you know, quite honestly, we believe that it's a personal responsibility for those of us who work in the institutions, because all institutions are subject to the same um, effects of discrimination um, as any other group. And so this is something that we really have to understand that the, the, the heart of creating a just workplace is, is understanding that not all people um, receive the same um, advantages and disadvantages. So that is kind of something that we have to accept. So we'd like you to consider this scenario. <clears throat> so Aparna is a nurse just out of school, and she arrives for her first day as a NICU staff member. She worked hard for this job, and she's made herself and her family proud. And she knows that many of her classmates were envious that she secured a coveted position in one of the busiest hospitals in the city. As Alberta sets to work, reading her patient's electronic chart and organizing supplies, she hears one of her new colleagues, Nancy, talk disparagingly about a mother and father who insist on bringing a large group of extended family members into the NICU at all hours of the day. The nursing staff has repeatedly explained that this is dangerous for the family's baby, who is very sick. Nancy complains that these people simply don't understand because they do not speak English. The family is Vietnamese and the hospital has limited access to interpreters. Alperna decides to talk to her new colleague about the cultural differences that might be motivating them to invite additional family to bond with their severely premature child. The senior nurse snaps at Alperna and tells her this isn't about culture, it's about that baby's health. So it, this can happen to any of us. In fact, it probably has. So the truth is that neither Aparna or, nor Nancy is wrong. Um, both have their patient's best interest at heart, and we can see how the dynamic between Aparna and Nancy can shut down communication and negatively impact their patient's well-being. So we'll come back to the scenario um, later in the presentation to talk about how um, social justice and creating a just workplace um, both play into delivering quality care to this patient. So when we talk about what is a just workplace, how do we cultivate a just workplace, we need to pay attention to leadership models and learn from leadership models that ensure that individual differences um, are honored and respected. So the individuals that come to the table have an equal voice in determining um, how um, the power is shared. And feminist theory is one leadership model that we can look to in that it challenged um, the basic tenet that patriarchal models of leadership were um, the best, um, that men um, had power and men um, were naturally designed to, um, to make, they were better at making decisions and better at um, determining what a, a course of action should be. So feminist theory really challenged that notion. And Current leadership models, transformational leadership models, um, draw a lot from feminist theory. So transformational leaders really work to share the power. So whether um, the idea comes from a student or from a patient or from the CEO of the hospital, um, all of those ideas are at least considered and brought to the table and um, respected um, for what they possibly could contribute to the conversation. So what we're really trying to challenge here is any kind of abuse of power. So, you know, whether it is um, a male-dominated system or whether it is um, a system where um, people who have money can make decisions over people who do not have money, we're really trying to challenge this idea that one's rank determines um, how much power they have. Um, Robert Fuller described the concept of rankism as the mother of isms, and that it, this idea that if I have rank, I can use it against you or I can use it over you is really um, the deepest threat to justice in the workplace, that if anybody uses their rank um, over somebody else, um, that is when we create an unjust workplace. Fuller also acknowledges that rank happens, and rank is not, is not necessarily bad, that one person has greater rank in a system over somebody else is not necessarily bad, but rankism, when that, that rank is used to um, oppress or threaten somebody else, that is when we have a problem. So how exactly does an unjust culture develop? As I 
alluded to earlier. An unjust culture simply develops when oppression is allowed to continue, when there's a system of oppression that is allowed to, um, to perpetuate. Um, so in short, the way I, I think of it is that oppressed people oppress other people. Um, Paulo Freire, um, an educator from uh, Brazil suggests that unjust cultures develop and persist because oppressed people become fearful of what they would gain if they challenge rank and oppression. So he says that the oppressed, having internalized the image of the oppressor and adopted his guidelines, are fe fearful of freedom. Freedom would require them to reject this image and replace it with autonomy and responsibility. So in short, not challenging or um, refusing or not being able, rather, to challenge rankism is um, a direct effect of rankism, that people fear the freedom that they would get if they challenge these systems because it would fundamentally then mean that I have to take more responsibility um, for the decisions that are made. And I think medicine, um, many people have written about how medicine is a clear example of how um, this cycle of oppression continues, that um, if I am to take responsibility for um, a patient's health, then um, that puts me at greater risk for being challenged or being being punished if something goes wrong, that kind of that kind of system. So what we're really trying to do is create a culture where that rankism is challenged um, when it occurs, so that even if it's a physician who is making the mistake or a nurse who is possibly doing something that is um, not in the best interest of a patient, that anyone in that system can say, you know what, this is something that we need to address so that we can move forward. So we're trying to challenge the status quo, and we're trying to create a system where calling out somebody, even if that person is in a higher ranking position, is not seen as a threat to um, the egos involved, nor is it something that somebody can f would fear that I'm going to lose my job if I were to threaten this system as it stands. So again, to reiterate, how is rankism perpetuated in healthcare and educational settings? Well, this is a system that has been in place for many years. So our um, image here shows how the physician has traditionally been the person with the most power, the most decision-making power. Um, the physician traditionally has given the nurse orders, which the nurse then um, fulfills those orders, and of course, last on in the pyramid or last in the system is the patient who simply is um, subject to the decisions that other people have made for him or her. So what we are trying to do again is, is to, to limit how this cycle um, continues, to call it out and to, um, to identify or to at least acknowledge that this hierarchy exists and that power when shared, can actually be in the best interest of all people involved. Um, so this is what, um, again, Robert Fuller describes as um, rankism, and what we're trying to do is challenge rankism when we see it. So in order to understand how oppressive or rankist behavior might be condoned by, um, you know, tacitly condoned by nurse educators and healthcare administrators, let's return to Auburn's story. So because rankism is so commonplace in our culture, it, it sometimes isn't immediately obvious. Many of us, I think, have grown up in families or in, in educational systems where we are used to being abused in this way, right? Where we're um, taught that you know, the teacher knows best or um, that you know, the doctor's always right. So this is, this is not a natural thing for us to be seeing how rankism is, is negatively impacting us. So, we can identify the parties most vulnerable in this scenario, so the, the, the ones who are most vulnerable to attack. So what makes these parties especially vulnerable? If we consider that physician-nurse-patient hierarchy that we talked about earlier, we can see how the patient, or this, in this case the infant child, is in danger of becoming a victim of the abuse of rank. Because this child can speak for herself, she's relying on her caregivers to speak for her. Her mother's interest to honor cultural beliefs about caring for a sick, possibly dying child. 
So this may mean enlisting the support of extended family and beloved friends to offer their blessings to the child should she die. So the mom is really trying to watch out for the interests of the child by, by ensuring that in the afterlife this baby's going to be okay. At the same time, from the Western medical perspective, there might be um, other things that may need to take precedence over some of these cultural practices. So the parents, because they are unable to speak English well, may not be able to communicate clearly how critical family support is to them. So moreover, it may be difficult to communicate their own complex beliefs about life and death and the care of a sick child. The parents, therefore, are relying on interpreters to communicate with those higher up the healthcare ladder their wishes for their child's care. So any of us who have traveled overseas and maybe been in a country where we don't we don't understand the language or we cannot communicate, uh, we don't have facility in another language, can relate to this family story. How difficult it would be to have such complex thoughts and complex ideas about what should be happening and then not being able to communicate them because you don't have that verbal skill, that language skill. So then Operna, the novice nurse in the scenario, some may view her choice to confront her superiors as disrespectful. And certainly, if again, if you grew up in a system or if you learned a system where um, that hierarchy was to be honored and respected, um, her behavior could really be seen as disrespectful and perhaps even condescending that she was, she was condescending to her, being condescending to her superior. So that said, her decision to speak out also makes her vulnerable to future attack from those who have power. This is known as the practice of relational aggression or uh, workplace bullying. And it's well documented in nursing, and many times this version of rankism impairs communication between nurses enough that the safety of a patient can be, become compromised. That is, if a junior nurse has been the victim of rankism in the past, it's not difficult to see how she might avoid asking critical questions about a patient's care if he or she senses that he or she will be attacked for doing so. So, one example, one learning experience where a junior nurse is told, you are wrong, and I don't like it that you confronted me, can leave a last question. Therefore, when it really can be life or death for a patient in future scenarios, um, you know, that person might, might choose not to speak up. So Nancy, the senior nurse in the scenario, could be identified as the person with the most powerful power, therefore the perpetrator of the mechanism. But we can't forget that she too is likely to have been called out and criticized by her superiors, other nurses, physicians, or even hospital administrators. So if this is the case, is it possible that her own rankest behavior is an attempt to avoid similar humiliation or criticism from her superiors? So again, if we keep in mind this concept of oppressed people, oppressed people, um, we have to ask, you know, what are the messages Nancy's getting about keeping her staff in line, or you know, was she called out when she challenged someone in a superior position herself? So all of these these factors create a system that can then lead to an unjust culture. So according to both Fuller and Fuller, the internalized feelings of being a nobody or being nobody is how rankism and oppression continues. So most importantly, the system robs individuals, a rankist system robs individuals of the sense of autonomy and responsibility they need to break this cycle. So over and over again, this concept of learned helplessness um, starts to come into play. That if I learn, if I'm repeatedly nobodied by somebody with, with higher rank, um, it's going to be harder and harder for me to believe that challenging this person is going to make a difference. So in our example, in our scenario, we can imagine how Opera might break back down from her superior to smooth their working relationship. In this and other cases, we can see how the negative impact of and might interfere with providing the best care for a patient. So we'd like you to stop and take a moment to think of a time when you have been, when you have observed a supervisor or colleague in a superior position make a poor decision. So just take a moment to, to visualize that scene. And then ask yourself, did you feel comfortable challenging this or her decision? or if it's a work situation you, you experienced in the past, um, we just want
you to take a minute to remember what that felt like to be in a position where you were no one. Possibly. So by this point in our presentation, we hope that it's evident how and why rankism is bad, why how it hurts individuals. So we can imagine how rankism degrades the quality of the communication between people who have power and those who don't. We can also see how believing overtly or, or covertly that some deserve better access to health care and better services once they do get access can significantly compromise quality of care. So many acts of discrimination in health care settings are intentional. We simply don't see that they're happening because they're, they become so much part of the background of our daily existence. So still, these acts can seriously harm people. So the true challenge of racism is not just identifying that it exists, because I, I, I do think that many of us know it when, when it happens. We know it when we feel it. But it's understanding how to change the pattern of abuse. So Upper Nine and Area attempted what Fuller would call a dignitarian intervention. She confronted the rankest attitude of her superior, and while this behavior is admirable and necessary, um, we can also see how tricky it is to rely on people with lower rank to lead the charge of change. So indeed, many great revolutions have been started by people with the least power, but to hold marginalized people responsible for changing their own oppressive system is simply another form of racism. So this is getting back to what, what we had said earlier, that it really is a responsibility of those of us who do have power in any system, especially in the healthcare system, to, to be aware of when racism is happening and how we can confront it, when we should confront it. So do people have equal access in our, in our healthcare setting? Are people being treated differentially? Are we working to minimize the long-term effects of discrimination? So moving beyond um, just identifying that discrimination is too bad and it exists, are we um, aware of how the long-term effects of discrimination might be playing into our educational settings and the nurses and health providers that we're training? And it's important for us to understand where the responsibility for change truly lies. That it's not that the people who have no power shouldn't have responsibility but really the people with power uh, have an increased height of responsibility. So when we talk about creating a culture of justice in nurse, nursing education and healthcare, we really are talking about a major paradigm shift. So in his four critical paradigm shifts for equity in healthcare, Paul Borsky outlines this major shift in thinking that must occur in order to cultivate a truly just culture in healthcare and healthcare education. This paradigm shift forces us to think beyond simply valuing diversity and focus on mitigating the superficial differences in healthcare beliefs. So the fundamental shift, or what Gorsky refers to as the base shift in thinking, is really moving away from this idea of equality to one where we think about equity. So most efforts to address discrimination in healthcare and healthcare education has focused on equality. This refers to the idea that all individuals deserve the same access to goods and services and fair treatment. Equity, on the other hand, takes into account the long-lasting effects of discrimination, prejudice, and racism. An equitable system is one that critically examines how some people, as a result of the systematic abuse of rape, will never have completely equal access to health care. This space shift is critical because it fundamentally challenges who is to blame if something, someone with the lowest rank fails. That is, if, is it a failure of an individual not complying with treatment or working hard enough? Or is it the individual or is the individual mired in a system that repeatedly interferes with his or her ability to succeed? So the two questions that Gorski asks us to ask ourselves is first, every person seeking health care have the opportunity to receive the best possible care and treatment, regardless of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status gender, religion, first language, sexual orientation, disability, or any other dimension of difference around which we currently see disparities in service and access. As long as the answer to this question remains no, then I, and is the system willing to be transformed? The second shift that Gorski talks about is one from cultural competence to equity and social justice. So for many nursing education programs, the multicultural curriculum 
consists of Diversity Day, in which one lecture addresses the cultural practices of multiple racial and ethnic groups. This lecture probably assumes that all of the healthcare providers belong to the majority of white culture, and there's usually very little opportunity to critically reflect on one's own racial and cultural identity. While a superficial understanding of different cultures' dietary practices, religious practices, and basic values might lead one to believe that he or she is culturally competent, Gorski notes that healthcare systems that simply focus on celebrating difference do not challenge the long-term effects of racism, sexism, homophobia, and other forms of rankism. To truly defeat rankism in healthcare, nurses and nurse educators must not only be able to identify cultural differences, but also understand how these differences have historically been devalued. So the two questions Gorski asks is, first, is the focus on feeling good and celebrating difference or on institutional change? Second, am I willing to push myself and the healthcare system out of our comfort zone to honestly and continually assess and address inequities, including racism, sexism, heterosexism, homophobia, classism, and ageism. The third shift that Gorski asks of us is to begin thinking of difference as the problem to really thinking about inequity being the problem. So here Gorski addresses how systems tend to blame the victim when difference disrupts smooth functioning. In our example, Nancy becomes frustrated when, her, when a language barrier emerged and she wasn't able to communicate clearly with her patient's family. Was the problem the patient's family or the lack of qualified interpreters in the system? So Gorski also, also addresses another important point when tackling an oppressive system. There are some who enjoy privilege in a hierarchy, and creating a just culture may mean that those people will lose some element of that privilege. For example, when a nurse is viewed as an equal contributor to a healthcare team, those with higher rank, for example a physician, may lose his or her status as the boss. This can be significant, this can be a significant obstacle to change, and it may require consistent reinforcement from supporters of the change that a system without rankism will lead to better healthcare outcomes and a healthier workplace. So the two questions Gorski asks are do I, or does the institution, tend to problematize difference and its complexities, such as language diversity, instead of problematizing the history and presence of inequities that have led us to a point of remaining unprepared to effectively and efficiently navigate these differences? Second, am I, or is the institution, willing to tackle inequities, even those that assign privilege to me and the majority of those in power in the healthcare system? The final paradigm shift that Gorski talks about is moving from the expectation that the patient will adapt to the sense of responsibility to be transformed. Gorski addresses here the question of who is responsible for promote, promoting transformative change. Again, our original scenario illuminates how many people from non-majority cultures must fully adapt to the Western model of medicine if they want to access healthcare in the United States. So if all of the onus of change lies on the patient, the party who has the least rank and the least power, can we call this a just culture? When applied to a healthcare education setting, we can all see how students, especially students from non-majority cultures, are required to adapt to a curriculum that, quite frankly, may ignore their own values and beliefs. As healthcare educators, we must be willing to listen to students' critiques or unique interpretations of a situation. Had a culture of justice been established in our hypothetical scenario, perhaps Nan would have been open to the feedback that Aparna was giving her, regardless of who did or did not have a rank. So the questions here that Gorski asks is, do I, or does the institution believe that it is the responsibility of the patient or client to adapt to the mainstream culture? And am I, or is the institution, institution willing to change to the same extent that people outside the mainstream culture are forced to change just to use our services? So, the question then arises, what can I do to promote a just culture at my institution, at my hospital, at my educational institute? So, committing to a cultivating just cultures in any workplace is difficult. We need to accept that. This is not always going to be fun, and we're not always going to be working with people who are ready for the change. So, we all have learned that people with rank matter more than people without rank. This presentation really serves as a clarion call to challenging that universal truth. And we're well aware that it may be a risky challenge for many people. So because those who fight for justice often face opposition, we urge you to find allies in your field 
who wish to challenge acts of rankism in your workplaces. So also, it's important to learn more about how other organizations in your community are challenging oppression and rankism in their systems. Many social service organizations, for example, have a strong social justice component built into their mission statements, and social justice is the guiding principle on which they conduct the business of their organizations. If you are looking to better understand how to form a more just workplace, local community programs that target a certain populations, so for example, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender support groups, programs for refugee populations, or organizations that provide support to new immigrant groups, often provide excellent examples of how social justice can be an effective foundation for a just workplace. The other thing to remember is that leading by example actually works. And there are many ways that we can promote non rankist behavior just in our own behavior. So model respecting dignity for all. Encouraging careful listening and understanding by being a good and active listener yourself. Interrupt exclusive behavior early. Play dumb and directly question. If somebody is discussing something in a, non in a disrespectful way, um, directly question that person and say, you know, I'm, I'm really wondering where this belief is coming from or where this assumption is coming from. Encourage empathy. Um, I think the, one of the, the underlying um, problems with rankist behavior is that it, um, it forgets that there's a human being behind the assumption or there's a human being behind that, the discrimination. And encouraging empathy trying to understand the point of view of the patient or the under, the point of view of the person who has less rank um, can really turn that rankest behavior around. Identify patterns that may be distancing others. Um, again, pointing out when you notice um, some people seem to be um, disengaging from a conversation or disconnecting from the institution or from decision making because they see that it's, it's not having um, any effect. Seek an ally and approach together. Um, sometimes what's difficult about challenging rankist behavior is that it does feel like you are entering an environment where you feel extremely threatened and feel extremely unsafe. Sometimes having an ally there and approaching um, an authority figure together can make all the difference. Uh, anticipate and rehearse um, for what might occur in that in any kind of confrontation or any situation where you might be approaching somebody with higher rank than you. Make direct eye contact and use I statements when address concern. Um, I think the most important thing is for, for to end rankist behavior is for all of us to be able to own and to accept our own feelings about what's going on. So practicing and using I statements is, is a big piece of the puzzle when it comes to learning new ways of communicating with one another. Model the use of inclusive language. Um, when the opportunity arises, um, challenge sexist language, challenge um, language that leaves communities or um, deliberately um, just ignores the presence of multiple voices. Note the distance the comments are making in the relationship, uh, pointing out when a comment has made you feel shut down, and note the positive impact on the organization when others are included. I think this is hugely important in terms of recognizing successes and when um, engaging in non-ranked and just behavior actually creates a more positive system. We recognize that learning to address issues related to justice requires a great deal of practice, practice, and more practice. Now, with each scenario, discuss what feelings would likely be evoked in this situation. What might be the risks of responding to this comment? What might be the rewards of responding to this comment? How does one decide whether or not to confront or not to confront? Now, let's take some time to practice. One person act as the responder challenger. One person act as the person making the intolerant comment and one person act as the observer. 
If you are the responder challenger, choose which situation you would like to role play. The observer will offer feedback afterwards, both things done well and things that could be further practiced. So in this presentation, we really focused on how to cultivate a just culture in a healthcare workplace. We strongly believe that in order to promote a culture of justice, individuals consistently engage in their own process of self-reflection on how their cultures, ideas, and values might be undermining their efforts. That is, without critical self-reflection, one risks staying in the comfort zone of our own biases, and change is less likely to occur. Effective diversity training is likely to provoke deep reflection and will probably cause some personal and interpersonal discomfort. This discomfort is reassurance that one's efforts to create a just culture is not merely theoretical. So we strongly urge, urge you to find opportunities to bring in diversity trainers who actively seek to ruffle feathers, who actually are doing more than um, moving beyond that, that superficially celebrating diversity and actually digging deep and asking the participants to to reflect on their own biases and blind spots and sources of discomfort with other cultures and their ways of um, looking at the world. We also believe that the most important component of cultivating a just culture is that it's evolving, that it's not something you can do once a year, it's not something that you can do in a special workshop or one class, but that it's a process and not an outcome of a single training exercise. Leaders may call for regular discussions and or evaluations of how well the curriculum in your program is addressing issues of rankism in the healthcare. Leaders may also need to provide safe spaces for people to talk about their own negative experiences with rankism in the current system in order to promote healing from the humiliation and degradation they may have experienced. In many cases, the simple act of bearing witness to someone's victimization can begin the cycle of healing. And this Talking openly about your history of rankism in your system or in, or in previous experiences you've had can really help students and your fellow colleagues identify examples in your current system. This presentation is just a beginning. Our goal here was to clarify how systems of oppression can lead to unjust cultures in nursing, nursing education, and other healthcare systems. We sought to define rankism and illustrate how it can undermine the quality of care that patients receive. Finally, we hope to illuminate how the prevention of injustice begins with a personal understanding of one's own biases and how ignoring these biases can lead to unintentional acts of rankism. We hope that with this awareness, you will engage in dialogue with your colleagues about incorporating social justice into your systems mission and your classroom activities. Ultimately, the teams on which we provide care and the quality of that care depend on it.